Hello. Hi, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Well, very happy to see you all in a new room at Rosecliff, separate from where we were yesterday or last week in the, in the ballroom. We're in the salon tonight. Um, welcome to our friends on Zoom. Thank you for joining us virtually. Uh, I'm Leslie Jones. I'm the Director of Museum Affairs and Chief Curator for the Preservation Society. And I have the great pleasure of running the department that oversees the fellows program that you're here to, you're here to hear about this evening. Um, I want to start by giving a great and special thanks to um, a member of our team who coordinates and manages the fellows program. Her name is Dr. Catherine Moran. Um, she joined us a few years ago and has really helped us transform this program. So she's in the hallway, but I hope she can hear us. Um, I just want to give Catherine a big round of applause and thanks for all of her work. <laughs> You'll be hearing from two of our distinguished research fellows this evening, Danny Zhang and Isla Stewart. Um, along with Ben Bowery, who presented last week, I, I really cannot say enough good things about these young scholars. Not only have they contributed to the environment at the Preservation Society in terms of their great personalities and work ethic, um, they've become great colleagues, and we're so excited to see what all three of them do with their, with their professional development going forward. Um, we have to thank Peter, Peter and Ido Kiernan also for the lectures this evening. Um, this lecture is named in their honor for all of the great support they've given the Preservation Society in the past and continue to give us. So thank you to the Kiernans. Um, a few quick housekeeping notes. Please do silence your phone since we're recording the program. Um, and we will, again, be doing a Q&A session at the end of the program with a walking microphone. So just raise your hand and one of us will come and bring the microphone to you. Uh, this does conclude our research fellows lecture program for the summer. Um, this last one here, the Kiernan lecture, so thank you for those of you who have joined us for both. Uh, our last official lecture for the season um, out of our total lecture series is this Thursday, August 8th, the annual John G. Winslow lecture. And that will feature Dr. Philip Rylands, who's the CEO and president of the Society of the Four Arts in Palm Beach. Um, Dr. Rylands will be speaking on his previous work as the former deputy director and director of the Peggy Guggenheim Collection in Venice. That lecture is sold out in person, um, but it, it, we do still have availability uh, online to join us via Zoom, so please visit our website, newportmansions.org, to register. We have a real treat also coming on Saturday, August 17th. A, a new thing for us to do is Saturday lecture, but uh, this is to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Monumenta. And if anybody was here in Newport 50 years ago, um, you probably remember the intrusion of a lot of really wonderful and large-scale contemporary sculptures coming throughout the landscape of Newport, including at Chateau sur Mer and the Elms. There were 54 monumental sculptures by 40 artists. And at the time, I don't think people really realized the significance of that installation. It has really influenced the way in which sculpture parks have been developed today. So we are commemorating that monumental uh, event 50 years later on Saturday, August 17th with a lecture here at Rosecliff with some of the original organizers. Uh, and we'll hope to you know, share some more in terms of uh, the work we t um, intend to do in the future when it comes to collaborating with uh, contemporary art groups. Let's see, so I'm gonna get uh, on to introducing our speakers. First, Dani Zhang received her MA in East Asian Languages and Cultures from Columbia University and has experience working with the American Museum of Natural History and the Asian Handicrafts Foundation. We've had the pleasure of having Dani as a research fellow here at the PS for the past two years. And her research during this time contributed to last year's groundbreaking exhibition, Celestial City, Newport and China. Um, and that research has also contributed to the development of new tours and our greater understanding of our really world-renowned uh, Chinese art collection, which I don't think we really knew that much about before. Um, with Danny's help, it's been an extraordinary journey. Of course, also with our curator of collections, Dr. Nicole Williams, we've really taken new information and made um, a vibrant uh, platform for our Chinese art collection. Uh, Danny will be leaving us and heading to Los Angeles, I believe, next week, where she will begin 
her PhD program at UCLA. So we're incredibly proud of, of Danny and all of her accomplishments. <laughs> this evening, she'll be presenting China and Newport, A Journey Through Two Centuries, in which she will discuss her exploration of our Chinese artwork and objects, many produced for a Western market. Through a close examination of materials, forms, and motifs, she will illuminate the nuanced relationship between Chinese art, American collecting, and display practices from the China trade as part of the Gilded Age. Following Danny will be Isla Stewart, who will be presenting Animals in the, Gil in the Gilded Age. Isla earned her MA in the History of Art and Archaeology from New York University and the Institute of Fine Arts, and was awarded the Mellon Summer Academy Fellowship at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Like Danny, Isla will also be headed off. She is going to a PhD program in the fall at Rutgers for their art history doctoral program, where she will focus on 19th and early 20th century female sculptors in the US and Europe. And one of our pieces that's going to be in the exhibition is the genesis of that decision, a beautiful bronze work by Rosa Bonar. So we're very excited for you as well, Isla. Congratulations. <laughs> Isla's work has contributed to a forthcoming exhibition that opens at the end of this month, actually, Wild Imaginations, Art and Animals in the Gilded Age. Uh, it's curated by our curator of collections, Nicole Williams. Um, it opens on August 30th upstairs, and her research has investigated important cultural themes through a range of fine and decorative objects, as well as period literature to illuminate significant develops, developments in Americans' changing relationships with animals during a period which shaped our attitudes towards animals today. I have learned so much through this research. Every time we have a museum affairs meeting, which is every other Monday, there's constantly an influx of information and all these unique finds that Isla has been able to bring to us. So again, we truly have benefited from the work that she's done here. So I'm pleased to first welcome Danny to the podium, followed by Isla. And again, congratulations to you both. Thank you for all that you've done. We will miss you, but we are looking forward to hearing from you this evening. Okay, come on up. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Leslie, for your very kind introduction. Um, and good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you for being here. My name is Danny Zhang, and I'm very excited to speak with you this evening with my, um, about my research fellowship at the Preservation Society of Newport County, um, which afforded me the opportunity to explore works of art with Chinese origins in our collection. As Rhode Island's largest cultural organization that protects preserves and presents the, the best of Newport County's architectural heritage. The Preservation Society of Newport County holds a vast collection of Chinese art from the 18th through 20th centuries. It vividly showcases a concentrated and intriguing history of the interaction between China and the US in the modern period, as well as showing a long journey of collecting Chinese art over two centuries. The Preservation Society holds significant decorative art that was relatively less known from the Qing Dynasty, showing us a bustling Qing Empire where vernacular craftspeople were celebrated. The collection encompasses objects from families like the kings of King's Coat, who participated in the China trade in the early to mid 1800s, to later Newport residents like the Berwins of the Elms who were introduced to Chinese art and artifacts by cultural intermediaries. By examining and researching selected objects, patterns of collecting and the connoisseurship were illuminated. This evening, I would like to share some of my favorite objects, which highlight the interesting shift in the pattern collecting in Newport, and can be roughly divided into two phases, featuring two typically different connoisseurship and the collecting styles. I call them experiencers and observers. Let's look into these two different groups. So the first phase of collecting took place during the China trade period, roughly from the late 18th through uh, mid 19th centuries. In 1757, the Qing court closed all foreign trade ports in China, except for the one in Canton. This significantly restricted Western merchants' activities in China preventing foreigners from traveling beyond the port and limiting their interactions with Chinese. At this time, most Westerners in China were China trade merchants who made their fortune 
<coughs> sorry, through trade in a carefully selected and narrow part of China. The Chinese objects they collected reflect their experience and were often purchased to commemorate an interesting period of their life spent in an exotic country and were closely tied to their identities as successful China trade merchants. Take one of the leading China trade merchant families in Newport during the second half of the 19th century, the Kings as an example. If you ever visited Kings Coat, what one of the preservation society's mansions, you would find yourself being immersed in an interior filled with Chinese objects collected by the King family themselves, including cloisonnés, ceramics, jades, paintings, wooden sculptures, lacquer objects, furniture, and more. Step into the library on the first floor. A portrait of Hou Kua centered by oil paintings of Canton Harbor captures visitors' view immediately. The remarkable painting reveals much about the kings and their relationship with China. Wu Bingjian, known as Hou Kua in English, was born in a merchant family in 1769. In 1806, he was elected as one of the leaders of 13 Hongs of Canton. Hongs, sometimes translated into factories, were actually the foreign trade center for Western merchants in China. Because of Wu Bingjian's generosity and sympathy, he maintained an excellent ret reputation among Western merchants. In addition to helping Western merchants do business in China, he loaned money to Russell and Company, where Edward King and William Henry King worked as partners for them to use as operating capital. He also made significant investments in the US, including the financing of railroads. Through West, uh, Chinese Western trade, Wu Bingjian became the wealthiest person in the world. In 1834, his wealth was estimated to be 26 million US dollars, the equivalent of several billion modern US do dollars. Um, interestingly, Wu Bingjian sent out his portraits along with other precious gifts to his business partners. In particular, his portraits worked almost like his business name card, business cards, strengthening his connections with Western merchants. And the Western merchants who received Wu Bingjian's portraits hung them in places of prominence in their houses, proudly showing off their close ties. Looking at these portraits, Despite the serene and the gentle look on his face, Wu Bingjian's powerful bodily presence certainly radiated the godfather against her vibe. <laughs> Just in the Boston area, you can find at least three other Wu Bingjian's portraits, each at, from left to right, Forbes House Museum, the Peabody Essex Museum, and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. I'd like to further explain the reasons that so many portraits of Wu Bingjian are now in New England. The China trade played an important role in the economics of American independence. Right after the American Revolutionary War, the first American mercantile vessel, the Empress of China, reached the city of Canton and returned to New York Harbor in 1785 with a full cargo of tea. It represents a future happy period of the US, as noted by newspaper Pennsylvania Packet. Through trading with China directly, American merchants were able to accumulate substantial profit. In addition, they enjoyed the financial support of Wu Bingjian and other Chinese investors in their American businesses, such as Russell and Compa Company and Forbes Railroad Company. The significance of these relationships can be expressed by Wu Bingjian's portrait in the King's Co. Library. The portrait was created by Guan Chaochang, a famous oil painter active in the 19th century Canton, specializing in Western style portraiture. Besides Guan Chaochang, oil painting production had a large market in the 19th century Canton, and a group of Chinese oil painters with exquisite painting skills emerged. Let's take a look at another oil painting that has hence in the King's Co. Library, the view of Canton Harbor. This painting is attributed to Yu Kua, active from 1840 to 70. He was an export picture painter, famous for painting the scenery of commercial ports in Canton, Hong Kong, and Macau. 
The painting owned by the kings shows a panoramic view of Canton Harbor, where they made th their fortune. Zooming in, we can see interesting scenes of mercantile vessels along with local residential junks. They are called Dan Jia Chuan in Chinese and belong to fishermen called Tanka people who live on boats. On this boat, we can even see the clothes they hand to dry. To a new porter in the 1800s, a scene like this was almost unimaginable. The king's knowledge of and the success in a foreign trade, a foreign land, as expressed through this painting, open a world of experience to those who might never have the chance to visit Asia in person. I also found an almost identical painting from the Guangdong Museum made by Yu Kua. These paintings vividly show the busy sea traffic and further illustrate a miniature of flourishing maritime trade in the 19th century. Interestingly, many Chinese oil painters from the Canton area in the mid 19th century focused on the same genre and streamlined producing similar paintings for their Western customers. Simply by looking at these two almost identical oil paintings by Yu Kua, it becomes clear that his painting style was more in line with producing merc mercantile goods, specifically for Western merchants, than creating high style Chinese artworks. That was mainly how he and his peers made profit. As a result, some Chinese locals called them hua jiang, literally picture craftsmen, instead of calling them artists, which slightly reflected a negative attitude that these paintings were less sophisticated and without much artistic value. From another perspective, however, we should all be thankful to these painters since these paintings vividly preserve a piece of significant history of China that most contemporary literary artists overlooked. The value these Chinese export oil paintings reflect not only their artistic achievement, but also their contribution to the history. Even though they did not accord with the traditional Chinese taste, they were just as important. This, art this artistic interaction between Ch China and the West was explored in our exhibition at Rosecliffe Mansion last autumn. The Celestial City, Newport and China. While researching objects for the exhibition, I met with a curator at the British Museum whose concurrent exhibition, China's Hidden Century, explored Chinese Western interaction in the late Qing period. When I visited, I was glad to build a connection with the curator, Ms. Jessica Harrison Hall, in the middle, and viewed the exhibition with her and Dr. Lu Pengliang, curator of Chinese art at the Metropolitan Museum. He's on the left. Both the Celestial City and the China's Hidden Century exhibitions delivered an important message that refuted a well-seated stereotype that Qing China disconnected itself from the world. Just from the cultural and artistic exchanges during the China trade, we can see that Qing China was far from an is isolated empire, even during the turbulent late Qing period. In addition to paintings, China trade merchants also brought back objects which reveal much about their experiences in China and the relationship between Chinese craftsmen and the Western audience. Cited in a place of prominence in a king's called drawing room, this trail of lacquer tables was made for David King Jr. in China and bears his initials. The hand scroll shaped illust uh, illustrations depict the daily routine in a bustling river town, perhaps Canton, while the form of the nasty tables reflects Western influence. A fun fact that I found is that three illustrations on these three nesting tables offered a gradually zoomed in view of what is visible in the outer image if we um, view them carefully. The illustration on the largest table depicts a view outside the wall, while the image on the smallest illustrates a view inside in which we don't see any fences or walls. When pulling out the tables, viewers seem to walk into the homes in Canton, just like the kings did. This motion also mimic, mimics how people view hand scroll paintings painted on the tabletop. The picture gradually reveals itself when viewers carefully unroll it. 
This fun interaction not only entertained the kings when using the object, but also recalled their travel experience in China. Among the wealthiest group of people in the United States during the China trade period, the kings used this exot exotic object to establish their identity and differentiate themselves from their peers. In 1858, decades after the first kings traded with China, David King Jr., nephew of William Henry King of Kingscourt, wrote to his parents, asking for their permission to join his uncles, Edward King and William Henry King, in a still profitable China trade business, saying that, there's nothing to be done in the US unless a man has plenty of capital, and I am not going to be a clerk all my life. It's too senile. <laughs> Later in the same year, David, who was already in China, wrote to his parents, I do my duty well, and any gentleman doing this can receive not else but cheap kind, kind treatment anywhere. Through his correspondence with parents, it is evident that even after decades of trading with China, adventurous young men like David King was still drawn to the fortune and the lifestyle offered by the China trade. Furthermore, the massive fortune through China trade not merely benefits their own family, but also Newport. It rejuvenated the city's economy and marked the king's civic pride. However, the opium trade that was central to their fortunes had devastating consequences for Qing China's economy and society. To summarize, American China trade merchants traveled to China and spent considerable time living there. In relation to China, they were experiencers instead of observers. For Newport's active in the China trade, the Chinese objects they collected have both personal and direct meanings, showing not only a specialized cultural knowledge they did not share with their American peers, but more importantly, a flourishing proximity with Cantonese home merchants. Viewed in the King's Co. Library, Wu Bingjian's portrait, surrounded by views of Canton Harbor and other Chinese objects, created a three-dimensional exotic space. And consider again how the China trade has been mutually beneficial to US merchants and Cantonese home merchants. The King's collection is telling us how these two groups of people built and developed deep connections and permeated with each other's lives. Instead of collecting art for aesthetic or financial reasons, these Chinese objects were personal, sentimental, and emotive with a mark of King's life experiences. Because of these, Chinese objects that kings collected tacitly demonstrate how unique they are. Through King's China cle Chinese collection, we see not only King's social cultural capital and their superiority among their American peers, but also their emotions hidden behind the objects. There were other new porters, like the wet moors from Chateau Samir, also involved in the China trade. If you are interested, you are more than welcome to visit these mansions and take a look at the Chinese collection in situ. By the 20th century, China became more open to its visitors, and those uh, from outside China had access to places far beyond the 13 homes of Canton. The majority of Americans who traveled to China during this time also changed from merchants to scholars, industrialists, and the wealthy upper class people who had the privilege to tr of traveling across the ocean thanks to improvements in communication and the transportation networks like steamships, railroads, and the telegraph. One business that changed Americans' views of Chinese art was the railroads. As American industrialists built railways in China, numerous precious antiquities were discovered and then excavated from ancient noble to tombs. These discoveries immediately shifted um, Western collectors' attention to ancient Chinese art and led to an ancient art hunt in Asia. In this period, wealthy people used Chinese art and antiques to show off not their own life experiences, but rather to illustrate their wealth, time, and cultural capital. This shift in collecting style also applied to the 20th century Newport collectors. Most new porters at the time probably had not been to China at all. Instead of experiencers like the kings, they were like observers. 
collecting Chinese art was driven by a sort of pursuit of aesthetic of beauty and personal values, not out of individual sentiments. The Chinese objects collected by New Porters rather reflect an interest in Asian cultural significance and history, which was so trendy at the time. One example is Alva Vanderbilt Belmont, who sent architects to China and had them build a Chinese tea house in the backyard of her marble house in 1912. Later, she opened it for women's suffrage movement meeting. This old photo from 1916, we see um, in this photo from um, 1916, we see that she had added several bronze lanterns under the gate and the um, tea house's eaves. Nowadays, they are hung inside the tea house. Alba believed these lanterns were precious Chinese antiques and said that she was fortunate enough to be able to buy a collection of very famous Chinese lanterns of old bronze. However, upon examination, I found one of the lanterns was inscribed with four characters, which translates to the first year of the Taisho era, a period in the history of Japan. And the first year of the Taisho era is 1912. These stamps indicated the bronze lanterns were made in Japan and in the same year when Alva had a tea house built and were not the ancient Chinese artifacts. She believed them to be. Alva was probably fooled by the contractors or maybe she was puffing up her own collection. Either way, her enthusiasm in collecting and displaying Chinese antiques was real, just like other contemporary American collectors. Among the second group of collectors, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney was an exception. Gertrude and her husband, Harry Payne Whitney, visited Asia on their honeymoon. These photos show they wearing Japanese costumes in Japan. They are on display at the Breakers, by the way. Gertrude and her husband's honeymoon travels to Japan to um, were well documented, but it was unclear if she had ever visited China Luckily, I found her diaries from 1897 and confirmed that she indicated that she took the Empress of China to China, stayed in Hong Kong for a week, and went back to Japan again. Does the name Empress of China sound familiar? Do you remember it was also the name of the first American mercantile vessel brought back tea from Canton to New York? It had been decades after the China trade, but that memory hadn't faded. Instead, people romanticized the China trade to commemorate the importance to the US. Although Gertrude didn't record, uh, record any anecdotes from this trip to China in her diaries, this experience definitely inspired her in her later art creation. Being an art patron who supported struggling artists, Whitney herself was also an exceptional sculptor and later founded the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York with her husband. In one of her self-portrait sculpture, she presented herself as Buddhist deity, employing two intriguing Buddhist gestures. Her right hand symbolized the fear not gesture, while her left hand symbolized the dispensing of boons, which may relate to her selfless aid to struggling artists. Moreover, Gertrude named her sculpture Xinhua, meaning Chinese. This self-portrait uh, portrait sculpture made by Gertrude reflected not only her inspiration from Chinese art, but also her intention of combining her values and aesthetic beauty with her cultural interaction with Chinese art. Besides a few rarefied collectors and enthusiasts who had been to China, most wealthy Americans who actively collected Chinese art never visited China at all. To fulfill the demand of collecting Chinese art, a group of people working as intermediaries and art dealers emerged. They worked as art experts advising American business tycoons on collecting ancient Chinese art, such as Lu Qingzhai, known as City Lu in English, who was one of the most important dealers of Chinese and Southeast Asian art of the first half of the 20th century, with gallery branches in Paris, 
New York, Beijing, and Shanghai that supply museums and private collectors worldwide, as well as Yamanaka and Company, the owner of which, Yamanaka Sadazilo, operated branch offices in Boston, Chicago, New York, etc. I added some firework animation, but it disappeared. <laughs> as well as uh, the seasonal um, shop during summer months in Newport. The image on your right um, shows partial view of Yamanaka's Newport shop. One jade brush washer on the right shelf looks so similar um, to a piece from the Berwyn's jade collection at the Elms Mansion and represents a popular form collected by Americans. Small and delicate ornaments, such as jays and snuff bottles, were incredibly popular among Newport collectors during the second phase of collecting Chinese art. The image on this slide shows a small tourmaline ornament, which came from Mr. and Mrs. Edward J. Second's collection. Mr. Berwind and his uncle, Berwind of the Elms Mansion, collected the bulk of the collection. After Edward passed away, his second wife, Maisie Berwin, gifted a group of jays to the Preservation Society, including this piece of Liu Hai, one of the gods of wealth, with his immortal three-legged toad. In mythology, Liu Hai uses the coins that the toad spits to help people in poverty. As a god of wealth, Liu Hai's image was incredibly popular among business people and can be found on various media of art in Newport such as a root sculpture on the left um, at the King's Coat and the Coromandel screen at the Chapstow, which is another Preservation Society's Gilded Age mansion. Beyond Newport, other American business tycoons from the 20th century collected Chinese objects with Liu Hai's imagery as well. This slide shows more um, representations of Liu Hai owned by, from left to right, Chicago industrialist Avery Brundage, New York businessman and the co-founder of Cisco, Herbert Irving, and the New York industrialist Charles Langfreyer. Representations of Liu Hai were not just for businessmen. They attracted different group of people in different ways. This table, we believe, was owned by Alexander Agassiz. Agassiz was an important marine biologist and naturalist who summered at his Newport Estate, Castle Hill, now the Castle Hill Inn, in the late 19th century. On this table, Liu Hai holds an enormous coin and is accompanied by two other deities. On the bottom of the table, his three-legged toad is looking up at him. We can tell that Liu Hai's image was so popular among Newporters that he is featured in the collection of a variety of people, not limited to businessmen. For Agassiz, Liu Hai reflects his attraction to China and specifically his fascination with marine animals, since he might have been most interested in Liu Hai's magical toad. FYI, this table is going to show at our forthcoming exhibition, Wild Imagination, Art and Animals in Gilded Age at Rosecliff in late August. Please stay tuned and go to check out this interesting object in person. Another really interesting object in the collection of the elms is a six panel table screen made of silk, soapstones, and wood. On each panel, artisans exquisitely painted landscapes and scenes, as well as decorated it with human figures, animals, vegetation, and buildings made from pieces of soapstone. They vividly captured an opera story in a chronological order from the first to the last panel. This unassuming small screen is much more than it appears at the first glance. If you carefully slide up the panel, you would surprisingly find a hidden layer of panels with erotic paintings. <laughs> the opera story on the top layer is unrelated to the erotic paintings on the bottom oh. layer. <laughs> Those erotic paintings fall into a big and specific genre in Chinese art called the Chun Gong Tu, literally spring palace pictures. However, having Chun Gong Tu on the hidden layer in the format of a screen is not so common. This interesting design points to an intriguing fact about the object. 
Its owner can choose when to view the Chenggong tool and whom to show it to. Although Mr. and Mrs. Berwin collected abundant Chinese objects, there's no evidence that they ever traveled to China. Although we don't have specific records for the acquisition of each object, it's probable that they were purchased from local art dealers, just like City Lu and Yamanaka and Company, who served as the intermediaries between East Asia and Western consumers. Characteristics of art and objects collected by this group of Americans in the early 20th century are novelty and aesthetic beauty. Aesthetic beauty was really paramount for these people, and they, in fact, talk about beauty's effects on them a lot. They describe Chinese art as uplifting and soothing in an almost religious way. Art historian Kathleen Pine was, has suggested that their responses to Chinese art relate to how they accumulated their fortunes. Rapid industrialization certainly brought massive profits to these collectors, but it also caused pressure, competition, and tension between people. In contrast, the beauty of art became a perfect getaway and it even offered a kind of religious experience, calming these business people physically and mentally. Unlike the object collected by American China trade merchants, which reflected personal sentiments, life experience, and identity, objects from the second phase reflect um, collectors' new ideas about the power of Chinese art, informed by their own modern experiences. The second group of collectors as observers represents the continued but transformed interests of Americans in China, and both faces are equally significant. When viewed together, they show a relatively complete interaction between American and Chinese material culture from the 18th through 20th centuries and even beyond. I'm so glad to contribute to this intriguing research and I'm sure there's much more to explore. Last but not least, I would like to give my special thanks to people who assisted me tremendously in my research. Your help is much appreciated. Again, thank you everyone. Now, please join me. In. And now, please join me in welcoming Ayla Stewart to present her research. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Danny, for starting us off tonight. And I also have to say thank you to Leslie for your lovely introduction from earlier. As you've heard a few times now, my name is Isla Stewart, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here tonight to speak with you a little bit about my fellowship at the Preservation Society and our upcoming exhibition, Wild Imagination, Art and Animals in the Gilded Age, which is set to open in just a few weeks right here at Rosecliff on August 30th. My specific fellowship is directly tied to the research in support of this exhibition. So over the past year, while I've been able to help our museum affairs team in a variety of capacities, I spent the bulk of my time conducting in-depth research on the objects in our collection that are featured in Wild Imagination. You may recognize this image on the screen from posters promoting the exhibition online or around Newport. The woman in the photograph is Newport summer resident Edith Wharton. If you're not familiar with her, she was the first woman to win a Pulitzer Prize for Literature for her 1920 novel, The Age of Innocence. She was also an avid dog lover, as you can probably tell. <laughs> she owned dozens of small dogs during her lifetime, two of whom are sitting on her shoulders on our poster. This photograph is one of many objects in the show that explores Americans changing relationships with animals during the Gilded Age. Wild imagination surveys the explosion of pet ownership and breeding, the popularization of natural history pursuits across the class spectrum, and the vital role Gilded Age Rhode Islanders played in advocating for the animal rights movement. The exhibition also looks at the impact of the era's groundbreaking zoological research and expanding industries, such as railroads, that hastened the destruction of animal habitats. Today, however, our focus is going to be a little narrower. 
I'm going to focus my talk tonight on a few really wonderful objects that highlight the different ways women's relationships with animals evolved during the Gilded Age. As women navigated the rapidly shifting boundaries around their involvement in political and social spaces during this time period, they increasingly organized female-run events, clubs, and institutions. At the same time, women artists strategically developed their skills, taking advantage of the opportunities they had even before formal art academies allowed them to study alongside their male peers. I have long been interested in how women used artworks to assert their talents, interests, independence, and equality many decades before they received the right to vote. So you can imagine my joy when, throughout the course of my fellowship here, I discovered how vital a role animals played in carving out a wider place for women in American society. I want to start by taking a closer look at celebrated artist Rosa Bonner's Grazing Ewe. Originally modeled in 1848, this particular bronze was cast around 1891 and is small enough to hold in your hands. It typically resides in Chepstow, one of the houses under the Preservation Society's care, and was owned by the local Morris family. The artist, Rosa Bonner, might be familiar. She is one of the most important and well-known women artists of all time. She was born in 1822 in Bordeaux, France, to artistic parents who encouraged their children to pursue artistic careers. By 1841, the prestigious salon in Paris accepted a drawing and a painting by the young artist. Over the next seven years, Bonner began creating bronze animal sculptures, routinely signing her work, Rosa B., which you can see in the top left. She became famous in her own day, both in France and abroad in the United States, and she was the first woman to achieve that level of artistic success. The portrait on the right shows Bonner in her later years in front of a canvas depicting horses. A fitting portrait, since Rosa Bonner is probably best known for her large-scale painting, The Horse Fair, which now hangs in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Bonner worked on this painting for approximately two years from 1851 until the Paris Salon in 1853. She attended horse markets in Paris twice a week for a year and a half in order to do so. Cornelius Vanderbilt II of the Breakers actually donated the painting to the Met in 1887 after purchasing it at auction. We actually have a nod to the Vanderbilt's connection to Bonner at the Breakers. So the next time you're there, make sure when you're ascending the staircase to the second floor, you take a, a look at the wall on the right where an 1890 engraving of the horse fair hangs. Rosa Bonner's sculptural practice is definitely less well known than her paintings today, but she began sculpting animals out of clay and wax very early in her career as a way to study the figures, poses, and anatomy of the creatures featured so prominently in her paintings. She picked up her love for animals at a young age. An early biography even describes the artist as someone who, quote, persuaded her father to admit a sheep into the apartment then little by little, the menagerie was increased by a goat, a dog, a squirrel, some caged birds, and a number of quails that roamed at liberty about her room, end <laughs> quote. When I first began researching Grazing You, I wanted to fully understand Rosa Bonner's sculptural practice. Our database dated the bronze in our collection as 19th century. I was hoping to narrow down the date range at least a little, and after some initial researching, I learned the first sculpture Bonner ever exhibited was an 1842 terracotta called Shorn Sheep. Months of research later, I determined that her best documented sculptures were the ones on the screen, initially modeled from 1842 to 1848, alongside the grazing ewe in our collection. These photographs show bronze versions, but the date connected to each sculpture in the caption represents when they were first modeled. Bonner would not exhibit a bronze sculpture until the 1848 Paris Salon. This portrait was painted by her brother, Auguste, right after the 1848 Salon and prominently connects Rosa Bonner with the two bronze sculptures she had submitted to the exhibition. Prior to seeing this portrait, I had only seen descriptions of Rosa Bonner's bronzes for the 1848 Salon, written simply as bull walking and sheep. A few sources described the 1848 sheep as a bronze version of her first exhibited sculpture, 
the terracotta, known as shorn sheep. I had a gut feeling that grazing ewe and shorn sheep might be one and the same, but at the, same, at the time, the only historical images I had seen were these six. And as you all also now know, Bonner modeled several different versions of sheep. And while none of these seemed shorn to me, it wasn't enough to prove my hunch. Until I saw this brightened image of Auguste Bonner's portrait. And I could clearly see that the bronze sheep for the 1848 Paris Salon was indeed the same as the grazing ewe in our collection. This is significant for a couple of reasons. Personally, I was really excited to be able to conclusively say that the grazing ewe was first cast as a bronze in 1848. I'd hoped to narrow down the 100 year date range, but I never thought I would be able to pinpoint it that exactly. And then more importantly, while Bonner purposefully stepped away from exhibiting sculptures in the 1850s, so her younger brother, Isidore Bonner, could focus on sculpture without interference, the demand for Rosa Bonner's bronze sculptures did not decrease. In fact, over the next four to five decades during the Gilded Age, miniature versions of all of her bronzes, like the one in our collection, were marketed and sold to collectors in the United States and Europe, contributing to Rosa Bonner's growing popularity. Bonner gave the copyright for her bronze animals to her brother-in-law, Hippolyte Peyrol, when he opened his foundry in 1852. Peyrol was responsible for casting an innumerable number of miniature bronzes during the Gilded Age from Rosa Bronner's earlier models, which you saw earlier. They were small enough and light enough for one person to easily carry. Their popularity probably stemmed from both their reproducibility and the bronze's devotion to naturally depicting their pastoral subjects in a time when nostalgia for a simpler way of life pervaded industrial societies throughout the United States and Europe. In all of her sculptures, Rosa Bonner presents the animal, whether bull, ram, ox, or ewe, as distinguished creatures with personal characteristics, behaviors, and expressions. This becomes readily apparent when you compare a grazing ewe to a real life sheep. When ewe graze, they stand with one front leg forward balanced by the opposite back leg also pressing forward. Bonner's bronze ewe appears in a nearly identical pose. The slope of the ewe's neck and the flatness of her ears is also dutifully observed in Rosa Bonner's bronze. People in industrialized city centers might not have been able to keep a sheep in their apartment, but they could buy a relatively inexpensive miniature bronze of a grazing ewe to feel connected to the pastoral while also showing their appreciation for one of the most dynamic artists of the 19th century. Bonner's devotion to depicting animals undoubtedly came from a real love for the creatures in her family's care. When she eventually moved out of her family's home, her menagerie only grew. But I do think her attachment to them might have gone beyond simple care. It was more acceptable for women to study pastoral and animal imagery than to focus on the nude form or the underbelly of modern society. It was also simply more accessible. Women were not allowed to attend formal art academies in the 1840s. Bonner could attend horse fairs, though. She could observe the animals around her and depict them in paint or clay or bronze. And because of that access and companionship, she was able to carve a place for herself in artistic society that no woman before her had ever achieved. If Rosa Bonner, with her level of international fame and artistic success, was relegated to certain spheres, everyday women faced even stricter boundaries. One of the most acceptable forms of artistic creation for women, however, was painted pottery. In the United States, the popularity of hand-decorated ceramics grew during the late 1870s into the larger American art pottery movement. In Boston's North End, the Saturday Evening Girls Club began as a way to involve working class immigrant women in the arts. One of the founders of the club, Helen Storo, funded the Paul Revere Pottery to offer a safe work environment for the women. The Goose Bowl on the right was made in 1917 by Sarah Gallner, a Jewish immigrant from Austria-Hungary. The geese frolicking around the entirety of the bowl reflects one of the popular lines produced by a Paul Revere Pottery, primarily for children. 
The animals the Saturday evening girls painted were usually barnyard animals, evoking the agricultural lifestyle of times past and not the gritty urban industrial space they inhabited in Boston's North End. This desire to observe, recreate, and understand the natural world, especially plants and animals, was not a purely artistic pursuit. Thousands of everyday Americans began pursuing some form of natural history in the second half of the 19th century. While filling cabinets of curiosities with specimens had been a popular pursuit for over three centuries, the passion for classifying living organisms expanded in the 19th century. Victorian age men would venture outside on expeditions to discover new species, which they would in turn shoot, stuff, and display as part of their collections. This image shows a group of men on a typical bird watching expedition with a man on the far left holding their newest specimen. Bird watching had become such a popular pastime in England and the United States that the American Ornithologists Union was founded in 1883. Women were not invited to join. By the late 1880s, however, American women were asserting their interest and knowledge about ornithology. Florence Augusta Miriam Bailey became an active ornithologist in order to campaign against the popular trend among women of wearing bird feathers and sometimes entire carcasses on their hats. She would eventually become the first female member of the American Ornithologists Union nearly 50 years later in 1929. But she did not wait to be accepted by the established ornithology community to begin working within the field. As early as 1889, she was advocating for a new type of ornithology in her illustrated field guide, arguing that, quote, the student who goes afield armed with opera glass and camera will not only add more to our knowledge than he who goes armed with a gun, but will gain for himself a fund of enthusiasm and a lasting store of pleasant memories, end quote. In this field guide entitled Birds Through an Opera Glass, Miriam Bailey strategically presented her scientific arguments as sophisticated and fashionable. Society women venerated the opera and the performers they regularly peered at through their opera glasses. If birds were worthy of opera glasses, perhaps they were also worthy of avoiding a dreadful fate as eternal hat decorations. Miriam Bailey did not see her exclusion from the American Ornithologist Union's masculine shooting practices as a hindrance, but as a benefit to the field of ornithology. She believed close observation offered more insight than killing, dissecting, or stuffing. These intricately painted porcelain cups and saucers offered another way that women could engage with ornithology and natural history through close looking. This coffee service in the Preservation Society's collection was created in 1875 by the Royal Worcester Porcelain Company in England. I was able to determine through my research that they were probably decorated by John Hopewell, an artist who focused on painting naturalistic birds and butterflies for Worcester. You may have noticed both the objects I've discussed so far in the Preservation Society's collections originated in Europe. This was fairly common for 19th century houses. Wealthy Americans and the burgeoning middle class were anxious to emulate their counterparts abroad when amassing collections and establishing themselves in society during the mid 19th to 20th centuries. For instance, when visiting either of the Vanderbilt mansions under the Preservation Society's care, you can also encounter distinctly European architecture, as you can see here. Both the Breakers and Marble House expressed the same desire to capture the prestige that European art and architecture could convey. These summer houses were also occupied almost exclusively by the women who organized the social events that marked a Newport summer. Their husbands often stayed behind entirely or only visited on the weekends. Because of this, the objects that fill these houses often speak to how women participated in social movements. While researching these particular coffee cups and saucers, I was able to form an unlikely partnership with ornithologists at Norman Bird Sanctuary here in Newport to identify the specific bird species on each cup and saucer. We had hoped to break down the boundaries between art historical scholarship and the sciences while deepening our understanding of these cups and, cups and saucers. But as an art history major who last took a science course my freshman year of undergrad, I didn't expect developing scientific relationships would be so fun, not to mention illuminating. I contacted Norman Bird about our exhibition and spoke to several ornithologists and even attended one of their free bird walks, which I would highly recommend, by the way, if you've never gone. 
Because of their generosity and devotion to maintaining a naturalist perspective while closely looking, I can tell you that this pale orange set resembles the real life birds the most closely. The common kingfisher appears here on the saucer on the top row. It is painted in a classic crouched pose with traditional kingfish coloring, kingfisher coloring. Bird watchers familiar with the species would have been able to identify the bird from this alone. Similarly, the bottom row shows the Eurasian bullfinch, whose black cap, bright pink coloring, and distinctive beak shape quickly give away its species. While naturalists increasingly focus their attention outdoors on observing birds and butterflies, pet owners' relationships with their domesticated animals only grew more intimate. Pet portraits, such as this one of Elizabeth Drexel Lear's papillon, Hippodale, reflect how thoroughly Gilded Age dog owners elevated their furry companions to familial status. This portrait was painted for the Lears by family friend and accomplished society portraitist, Mariette Leslie Cotton in 1910 as a Christmas gift when Hippodale was six years old. Leslie Cotton also painted an earlier portrait of Hippodale as a puppy for the Lears that is now in a private collection. Perhaps you've heard from her tell-all book, King Lear and the Gilded Age, that Elizabeth Drexel Lear's marriage to Harry Lear, the 400s beloved arbiter of social taste, was anything but happy. She masked her private unhappiness by thrusting herself into the swirl of social life. She was one of the most recognizable of the Newport set during the Gilded Age, as she wore the most fashionable clothes, attended and hosted some of the most important social gatherings, and overall avoided dwelling in the domestic realm of her life. At the beginning of her marriage to Harry Lear, she was a young wed widow who found herself in a second loveless marriage with her only child from her first marriage away at boarding school. Hippodale acted as Drexel Lear's companion, allowing her to be both fashionable and maternal in public, while also offering affection in a domestic realm where little existed between husband and wife. In many ways, lapdogs had more access to society women than their children, who were often cared for by staff. <laughs> Drexel Lear's son did not live with her, but Hippodale had his own armchair, designed by Jules Allard. Dogs were both companion and accessory to the society women who had the leisure time to pamper, train, and breed them. Whereas previously, the most popular breeds were primarily used for hunting or sport, smaller breeds meant only for companionship and as a means to signify wealth began to dominate social circles. Women embraced their pint-sized canine counterparts with a vigor. I found an illuminating list of 19 distinct reasons why women loved their dogs, published by the New York Women's League for Animals that included. Number one, he doesn't talk back to you. <laughs> number eight, you have no rival in his affections. His love is all yours. Number 14, he misses you when you are away. And number 16, he is faithful unto death. Compared to an unhappy marriage or a lousy husband, dogs clearly come out on top. As a papillon, Hippodale's small stature and charming disposition allowed him to act as the ultimate fashion accessory as well as pampered companion. Elizabeth Drexel Lear's most public portrayal by popular society portraitist Giovanni Boldini features Hippodale in this way, as accessory first and dog second. Painted in the artist's studio in Paris in 1905, Drexel Lear's portrait debuted at the Salon to rave reviews. The Lears were so enamored with the portrait, they brought it with them to Newport for the summer and then Philadelphia for the winter, where it was installed in the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts exhibition to great acclaim. Hippodale blends into the swirling brushstrokes of Elizabeth Drexel Lear's dress as she clutches the papillon in one gloved hand. The oversized pink bow tied around his neck coordinates with his owner's elegant gown. Some reviews of the painting remarked that the dog appears much like any other, but some of the women who admired the portrait said they could recognize him. Hippodale's familiarity with audiences no doubt came as a result of his owner's public image. Furthermore, my research revealed Drexel Lear engaged charitably with Hippodale through the New York Women's League for Animals Dog Brigade. The Dog Brigade helped to fund the free hospital and dispensary for animals in New York City. To enroll as a member of the brigade, an annual subscription of $1 was required. On payment of the subscription, a special medal was given to the dog which served as a badge of the brigade. 
and a special collecting box was given to each collector in which all money received had to be placed. This system allowed the dogs themselves to actively participate in the animal welfare movement by collecting pennies for the penniless. The money from the subscription supported the treatment and good care for all manner of animals in New York City whose owners would not otherwise have been able to afford medical care. The New York Women's League for Animals began as a direct response to the diligent work of Henry Berg, who founded the first American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, no more commonly as the ASPCA, in 1866. If you're interested in learning more about Berg's groundbreaking work, there's a section in the exhibition dedicated to his activism. As you can see here in the pamphlet for the New York Women's League, Hippodale's name appears next to Mrs. Harry Lear. Elizabeth Drexel Lear's personal name completely disappeared with her marriage, and yet her papillon is explicitly named when registered with the brigade. Even while immersing herself in public charities like the Dog Brigade, Drexel Lear was constantly attached to her husband and all the associations that came along with being married to the 400th self-proclaimed jester. In addition to registering their purebreed dogs with charitable organizations, society women participated in dog shows from their earliest inception. The Westminster Dog Show held their first competition in May 1877. The show proved incredibly popular with society women, and by 1888, Anna Whitney, pictured here, became the first woman to serve as a judge at the competition, overseeing the St. Bernard category. This photograph shows Whitney in the center of the aisle at Madison Square Garden, surrounded by the large dogs she was tasked with judging. The blurry mass just to her left is proof that dogs have been unable to hold still for photographs <laughs> for well over 100 years. <laughs> Perhaps breeding dogs was seen as an acceptable activity for women because of the easy association with reproduction, or maybe the dog show circuit was so novel and women's involvement in dog training and breeding so swift that before men could ban women from participating, they were already running the programs. The first dog show in Newport took place in 1902 at the Newport Casino. The next year, Anna Whitney came to town to judge the competition, where Alva Vanderbilt, shown on the left, entered her French bulldog, aptly named Dollar, and won top prize in his category. The next year, in 1904, two more of Alva's bulldogs once again placed in the competition. After an extended hiatus, the Newport dog show returned due, due to the efforts of society women. Under their leadership, the dog show expanded to such a degree that by 1914, there were too many entries for the competition to be held at the Newport Casino. Some of those dogs featured at that expanded competition appear in the newspaper article on the right. Soon after, Alva Vanderbilt appears to have turned her attention away from dog shows and toward the suffrage movement's fight for the right to vote, but her affection for bulldogs remained. This later photograph shows Alva at her home in France with an English bulldog. Throughout her life, Alva's personality was compared to that of a bulldog, determined in her pursuit of ambitions. Alva Vanderbilt was also a noted exception to the generalization of society women taking a hands-off approach with their children. She took an extremely active role in raising and instilling her children with the beliefs and morals she thought would most aid them. For example, in 1887, she commissioned this portrait of her youngest son, Harold Sterling Vanderbilt, while abroad in Paris. The painter, Charles Joshua Kaplan, was popular among European and American social leaders for his romantic 18th century style that represented his subjects in soft tones. Shown at age three, Harold's ability to protect and care for his feline friends spoke to a larger moral belief the children of American businessmen were being raised to care for the broader American public, who were often described as helpless and ignorant about business and cultural affairs as the kittens cradled in young Harold's arms. The Vanderbilts believed they knew how to guide American society and their children were being raised to follow in their footsteps. If the orange tabby can fall asleep in his arms, then surely Harold can be trusted with the Vanderbilt family businesses. As contrived as these notions might seem to us today, the bent toward animal welfare and the stewardship of helpless creatures definitely aligns more with our modern beliefs about the responsibilities people have when dealing with animals. Thankfully, our understandings of how best to care for, interact with, and protect animals has evolved since the Gilded Age. Animal welfare movements receive generous donations every year. 
pet ownership has only increased. And perhaps most significantly, women have been able to carve out a larger place in society with the help of the animals that they were able to care for, observe, and artistically render. Gilded Age artists who set out to capture the innate individuality of their subjects started down this ever-changing path. If you'd like to see the objects discussed today and many, many more in person, we hope you will be able to come back to Rosecliff starting August 30th for Wild Imagination, Art and Animals in the Gilded Age. I have to briefly thank <laughs> Trudy Cox, William F. Lucy, and Ido and Peter Kiernan for their enduring and ger generous support. I also want to thank Nikki Williams, Leslie Jones, and the entire Museum Affairs Department, who not only have offered invaluable insight into curating and caring for historic objects, but who have also made Newport feel like home. I am forever indebted to every single one of you. And finally, from Hippodale and myself, thank you to everyone in the room and on Zoom for your attention. Thank you, Isla and Danny. Does anybody have any questions for our speakers? Okay, right here. First of all, I want to thank you both. Very interesting evening. Uh, made us see things maybe in a way I would have never noticed before. So that's a, a quality evening. Thank you both very much. Uh, my curiosity was uh, Rosa Bonher, mm. who um, the animals that she was uh, sculpting, mm. uh, kind of a masculine thing to do. Mm. <laughs> um, what information informed or gave her the confidence to not be afraid to be a woman mm. and not choosing a pseudonym as so many other people in that era did who were creative? I think Rosa Bonner was quite comfortable in her personality. She was always described as confident and ambitious from a very young age. So the fact that it was meant to be a more masculine thing, sculpting, I never read anything in her writings that suggested she cared about that. She used, she has this one quote that's great, where I think it's something along the lines of, the only men I like are the bulls I sculpt or the bulls I paint, <laughs> something like that. Um, so I don't think that, it was definitely a factor in her mind. She knew she was a woman. She knew that because she faced roadblocks blo at every turn when attempting to create art. When she did the horse fair, she ended up having to get a license so that she could wear pants because she was getting harassed so horrifically. And once she put on pants, no one even noticed that she wasn't a man. So it was definitely in her mind, but I don't think, I think it was just her personality to go after what she wanted despite any limitations that the world might have been putting on her. Oh, yep, coming over here. To further that question, I enjoyed both of your lectures immensely, by the way, thank you. Um, in the horse fair, she portrays her, there's a self-portrait of her dressed in men's clothing. And I'm curious if she entered the salon as a, just an anonymous painter that no, she, she didn't enter the salon as an anonymous painter. She entered as Rosa Bonner. It was always her name and her first name in particular. Okay. She attached her first name. That's why I like her signature on her, her paintings and her bronzes so much because she signs her first name, which is, you know, if you sign Bonner, maybe a toss up, yeah. but if you sign Rosa B, Clearly a woman's it name. feels more feminine. The, the image here. It's probably her as a, in a self-portrait as a man. It's hard to conclusively prove that. Um, but I, I do think she was very aware of what she was doing and she was proud of herself. So putting, putting yourself in your art is very common, as I'm sure you all know. Um, but yes, I think she, she wasn't disguising who she was. She was definitely leading with I'm Rosa Bonner. 
and that name was the name that carried the most weight, even though her entire family were artists. She was by far the most popular. I think we're giving you more good context for your PhD studies, by the way. More, more <laughs> questions to answer. Do you have another question? Thank you. The payroll, um, are those signed, Rosa B, or are they, how mass produced were they? They, so this is part of what I'm going to continue to be looking at, figuring out more about the exact number and are trying to figure out more about the exact number of sculptures that were produced and how they were marketed. I didn't get the time really so to dive into that. So they're not limited editions? No, okay. they weren't limited editions and it was decades. Ours, okay. I'm pretty sure, was 1891 and it was first 1848 and it didn't drop off during that time period. If you do searches for Rosa Bonner bronze animals, you'll see that there are dozens upon dozens of them that have been sold at auction over the years. So tracking that is something that I want to look into in more detail Thank when you. I'm at Rutgers. Um, first of all, um, excellent presentations, both of you, Thank and good you. luck during your grad studies. I'm sure it's going to be a very fun time. <laughs> um, it will be, yes. Yes, it will. <laughs> it will. Yes, it will. Just tell yourself that. Um, Ms. Ms. Zhang, I've got a question for you yes. about the, so when the, when there was a change of um, Westerners purchasing of Chinese art to going to China and digging up artifacts and then taking them back, um, have any of those artifacts come back to China? Um, are you talking about the late Qing period artifacts? Yes. Oh, so um, basically uh, what they could buy is export um, art. So majority of them stay here. I haven't heard anything have come um, returned back to China. So there's no, I mean, just as, because, because of course there's a lot of questions about um, the British art collection and returning uh, yeah. those items to the places that they took them from. I was wondering if there was a similar activity happening right. with this. Yeah, because that would be actually happened in the second phase when people shifted their attention to ancient Chinese art. So that's why um, Chinese people would like to um, um, get back the ancient Chinese art. But for the, the, previous, the first phase, um, those arts were created um, specifically for export market, for overseas market. So they're good. Stay here. <laughs> We have time for one more question. Okay, well then a comment. These were excellent, excellent presentations. Thank you both so much. I know you put a lot of effort and a lot of time into them. Uh, I think we've all learned a great deal. And again, um, it's wonderful to see two fellows whose contributions resulted in exhibitions. It just goes to show that this program does have a lot of legs underneath it and it means a lot. And also their research will live past those exhibitions as they've been incorporated into tours that we host at all of our properties. So I just wanna thank you again for all of your dedication to the Preservation Society and we wish you the best of luck going forward and hope that all of you are able to join us on Thursday to see Dr. Philip Rylands. Thank you. Thank you.